Hi everybody. In this lecture I'd like to talk to you about Van der Waals bonds. Now these types of bonds were originally proposed by this man, Johannes Van der Waals, to help explain the deviations of um, gases from the ideal gas law. And it was his theory, of course, that um, as you chill down an ideal gas, that the um, molecules get slower right, as you chill it down. And so that means that if they get close to another molecule, they'll spend more time there. And then in that amount of longer time that they spend there, they can induce dipoles within each other that then causes it to feel an attractive force. So that was the origin of all these ideas. But I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself a little bit. Let's talk about the different types of Van der Waals bonds. So they're listed here in terms of strongest to weakest, strongest at the top, weakest at the bottom of this list. We're going to kind of go through these one by one and discuss them. So at the very top of the list, in the strongest of the bonds that fall under this class, you have ion dipole forces. Okay, so here um, you have an ion, of course, which has a, a charge, and then you have a permanent dipole moment. And then, of course, what's going to happen is the um, positive um, charge, the positive ion here, is going to uh, be attracted to the negative side of the dipole, and they form a relatively strong bond. It's actually strong enough, for example, that this is the attractive force that's responsible for dissolving something like table salt when you put it in water. Okay, so in the water, water has a permanent dipole moment, right? And then the table salt um, has a sodium and a chlorine ion that dissociates in water, gets tugged apart in water because the attractive force between the dipole and the sodium or chlorine ion is strong enough to pull them apart, okay? Next on the list are dipole-dipole forces, and those are sometimes called orientation or Kiesem forces. You might hear them referred to as that in the literature. So these are forces between molecules that both have permanent dipole moments, such as water. Now, speaking of that, there's an especially strong category of Kiesem forces that's known as hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds form between molecules that have Da, 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 hydrogen in them, <laughs> especially groups that have, say, for example, a nitrogen and a hydrogen, an oxygen and a hydrogen, or something like hydrogen and a fluorine group, okay? So water, ammonia, hydrofluoric acid, these are hydrogen. These can form hydrogen bonds. Now, these have very long, uh, very strong intermolecular forces. So you've probably seen, for example, water, um, forming a meniscus inside of a container, and that's because of the very strong capillary forces, the very strong forces that the water molecules feel towards one another, okay? And they can also cause um, high boiling points, okay? So high boiling points and high surface tensions. Okay, the next class that we'd like to talk about is the dipole-induced dipole forces, and these are also known as induction or Debye forces. Now, these are weaker forces, and they occur when you have a permanent dipole moment approaching an initially neutral atom or a molecule with a symmetric charge distribution. So what happens then is that your permanent dipole moment, as it gets closer to your neutral atom, you can envision your neutral atom or molecule as having this electron cloud around it. Right? So when you have something with a permanent dipole moment approaching this electron cloud, then it tugs on that charge distribution from the cloud. And that causes the distribution to become asymmetric and induce a dipole moment in something that originally might not have had it. Now, once this um, uh, force is in place, right, once you have induced a dipole in the originally symmetric uh, molecule, then it stays there okay, until something stronger tugs it away, all right? So that's um, how something that seems like it should be transient actually sticks around. You can also get, and this is the weakest in the, the list here, induced dipole, induced dipole forces. Now these are called sometimes dispersion or London dispersion forces. So what happens here is let's say that you have two neutral atoms or molecules that have symmetric charge distributions, right? But they still have the electron cloud, so the electrons are whizzing around. 
Now, what might happen is that for a split second, say, as they're whizzing around, you'll get uh, a break in the charge so that you'll have more negative charge on one side than the other, which means that there's a temporary dipole moment in that atom or molecule. Now, when that happens and it's near another molecule, that temporary dipole moment can induce a dipole moment in the other atom or molecule. Now, once they're induced, they have a tendency to stay there, okay? So it's not a very strong effect, it's not a very large effect, but once they're there, they're there, and you have a weak attractive force between these two neighbors, okay? Now, these forces are going to be stronger uh, for larger atoms, and that's because they have more electrons. So if you've got more charge, you can have more charge separation, and that makes sense. Now there's another fun extra point that goes along with this. Your polarizability, or how easy it is to induce a dipole moment in a material, that increases with atomic size, okay? So we mentioned this earlier. First of all, there's more electrons, and so you can uh, pull it apart more, more charge on either side because you've got more charge to have. So that's why the boiling point of argon, for example, which is minus 186 Celsius, is so much higher than the boiling point of helium, which is way down at 4 Kelvin, or minus 272 Celsius. So by the same analogy, the boiling point of iodine, which is a whopping 184 Celsius, is a lot higher than the boiling point of fluorine. So it's, it's how big they are that really impacts um, the polarizability. To get into it a little more deeply, hydrocarbons and other nonpolar molecules that lack strong dipoles, these are really the only attractive forces between these molecules. Now the dipoles are weak and they're transient, and they're going to depend upon the contact area between the molecules. So that means that your force actually increases with the surface area. So if you have a small molecule like methane, then it has weak intermolecular forces and a low boiling point. But as you grow your molecular weight, your boiling point goes up because you're increasing the surface area of your atom or molecule, okay? So dispersion forces will increase with increasing molecular weight. Well, how do we quantify these van der Waals forces? What equations can we use to describe them? Okay, so uh, the Leonard-Jones equation is very commonly used to model van der Waals forces. And on this slide, I show you the potential energy for van der Waals bonds. So this is the potential energy U, which is a function of uh, separation between the um, atoms or molecules, uh, that separation distance we'll call R, is equal to epsilon times 2 over R VDW, which is the van der Waals radius, over R to the 12th power minus 2 times 2 times the van der Waals radius um, over R to the sixth power, okay? So, um, I'm sorry, there's a typo there. No, that's right, okay. So, what this is, is this is a potential energy, and you can see that in this potential energy equation, you have both a positive term, and then you have a negative term. Now, in energies, if you have a positive energy, then that's a repulsive term. Okay, and if you have a negative energy, then that means it's bound or it's an attractive term due to the van der Waals forces. So since you have both a positive and a negative term, um, it shouldn't be any surprise that when you plot this out, uh, here's what you get. Okay, so you have a, um, a positive repulsive um, potential here. Okay, so this is the positive part of your potential energy here, and that means that you've got a repulsive force, and then you have the negative attraction regime here, okay? So negative means bound, okay? All right, so going back to this equation a little bit, let's discuss it in a bit more depth. Here, epsilon is the well depth, okay? The van der Waals radius is also known as the hard sphere radius sometimes, and then of course R is the center to center spacing of the atoms or molecules. So for example, in this plot that I showed you here, this is for a hydrogen-hydrogen bond. 
and epsilon, the well depth, is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 22 joules, okay? Now remember that on the order of 10 to the minus 19 joules, that's about an electron volt. So if you have any feeling um, for uh, what this is, minus 13.6 electron volts, for example, is how tightly the electron is bound to a hydrogen atom, okay? So a lot of uh, ionic bonds, covalent bonds, those will be on the order of an EV or so, so this is more like a milli EV, so it's a lot smaller, okay, um, as we understood. Okay, so here the van der Waals or hard sphere radius for the hydrogen-hydrogen bond is about 0.12 nanometers. Um, so what I did was I just plugged those numbers into the Leonard-Jones equation and generated this plot that you see here in Maple. So this is the plot of the potential energy. So when um, atoms or molecules are bound, they're down here inside this well, and then in order to free them, they have to receive energy to break that bond. We talked about this in a previous lecture. But you can also take your potential energy, um, and to that function, you can do the negative gradient of your potential energy, and you'll end up with an equation for the force. All right, so here, the force from uh, van der Waals' bond F of R is equal to 12 epsilon times uh, 2 times the van der Waals radius to the 12th power divided by R to the 13th minus 2 times the van der Waals radius to the 6th power divided by R to the 7th. So um, that's what we've got there. Okay, so there's the force. Now I've also done in uh, Maple a plot of the force here. Okay, so you can see that as you start to shove those two atoms or molecules together, as R goes to zero, then you have a very strong positive, which means repulsive force. Okay, so they're going to resist being shoved together. In fact, that force is going to go to positive infinity as you try and shove them tighter, tighter of course. So it's this strong force that prevents atoms or molecules from getting too close to one another. And it's this force that prevents us from, I don't know, putting our hand and phasing through the wall or falling through the floor, okay? But, of course, if you look down here at the bottom of the curve, there's also negative forces here, which implies an attractive force, all right? So if you zoom in on that part of the plot, the negative or the attractive van der Waals forces, those are on the order for at least this hydrogen-hydrogen um, uh, bond of about a piconewton, okay? Now, that doesn't seem like very much, but if you think about it acting on every atom or molecule in a surface that's near another surface, and you think about how many atoms or molecules there are when two things touch, right? Then it can actually add up quite quickly, okay? So if you compared the force of gravity, for example, on an atom or molecule, atom or molecule to the van der Waals force, the um, van der Waals force would be many orders of magnitude larger. All right, so when does this come into play? Well, if you have um, something with a very high surface area to volume ratio, okay, so that you don't have a lot of mass, right, um, but you have a lot of surface area, then uh, that van der Waals, that attractive van der Waals force can do things like, oh, I don't know, help you walk up walls. So this is how insects and geckos and animals like that actually do walk up walls and cling to ceilings. See, they're tiny, they're small animals, and so they have a high surface area to volume ratio. They don't have a lot of weight, right? So the tug of gravity downward on them is small compared to the size of the van der Waals forces in between their feet, right? Their little feet and the wall. Now, how do they maximize this force? Well, it's interesting. Um, bugs, for example, like uh, here I have pictures that we took in the scanning electron microscope here on campus um, for educational outreach. The bottom pictures are pictures of bees, right, zoomed in in the scanning electron microscope. And then the top pictures are pictures of tarantulas, okay? So if you look close up at these tiny animals, um, they have a lot of these little hairs all over their bodies and their legs. So all these hairs have a very high surface area to volume ratio, right? So when they walk on the wall, a lot of these little hairs are touching the wall, and then there's van der Waals forces in between those hairs and the wall. 
So they're maximizing their surface area to volume ratio with all these little tiny hairs. And you can see that, for example, in this tarantula, even each little individual hair has little hairs coming out of it, right? And here's a zoomed in picture of that here on the right, okay? So that's how insects walked up walls, van der Waals forces. And it's also what keeps your hand from phasing through the wall. So no matter how many superhero comics you might have read, it doesn't seem very likely. Thanks, van der Waals. All right, I'll see you later. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in class.